The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Franka Klingler. I am a scientist here at Biosolv IT and we're very, very happy to host this webinar about the COVID Moonshot project today. We have all the main heads of this project here and uh, I would like to start with a few technical things to ensure a good audio quality for everyone. You're all muted by default. So we are um, not, a, you're not able to speak. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box that you have in this control panel at the right of your screen most of the time. And um, to give you the best experience that you can relax and enjoy this talk, so we're recording this session. So you can access the video later on. We will send you the link once it's online. And Lisa will be our chairman today, so I will be handing over to her now to introduce you all the other speakers. Lisa, it's yours. Hi, everybody. My name's Lisa Cox. I'm the project manager for the Moonshot project. Really excited to be involved with this project. Um, and we'd like to really thank everybody for joining the webinar. It's great that we've got such a high level of interest from uh, such a wide group of people in contributing to the project. So we're really happy to have this level of engagement. Um, so we're delighted today to be able to just share a bit more information with you. Uh, and we're gonna, we've got the key contributors to the project here, the key leaders of the project who are going to be talking a bit more about the background to the project and where we're up to with it, the progress that we're making. Um, so uh, many thanks for everyone for joining you. Uh, I'm just going to introduce which speakers we we're going to be hearing from today. Uh, and so we're very grateful that we've got Frank von Delft here, who is the professor, professor of structural chemical biology from Oxford University. Um, he's also a beamline scientist at Diamond Light Source. So welcome to Frank, who's um, gonna be presenting to us. Um, I'd also like to welcome Neil London, who's the Assistant Professor in the, uh, Organic Chemistry at the Weissman Institute of Science. So welcome to Nia. Um, we're going to be hearing from John Kodira, who's an Associate Member at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre. And we also have Alpha Lee, who's the Chief, Chief Scientist at Postera. And they will explain a little bit more about their roles as we talk, go through and they present their, their subject matter. Um, before we um, go into the talks that they're going, they're each going to be presenting for around five minutes. And uh, at the end of all of the talks, we'll come back and we'll have a question and answer session. So um, if you chat, uh, put in the chat any questions that you'd like to raise in that session, then that would be great. Before we move to the um, presentations, um, we'd just like to find out a little bit more for, about you, the audience. And so Franca is going to just take you through um, the poll questions um, and ask you to contribute. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, for introducing everyone. It's always nice to give our speakers a feeling of who's the audience today. So I've launched that poll and I kindly ask you to vote if you're a medicinal or a bench chemist if you're a computational chemist, if you're from the crystallographic side of the world, or if you're from the managing level, if you're none of the above, which a few people already voted, we're of course interested to know what you are, so please be so kind and put this in the chat box and help us to give more information to our speakers who you are. And as most of you have voted, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two. One, I'm going to close it and I'm going to share the results now with everyone that you know. So we have a strong majority of, well, it means strong, we have a majority of computational chemists here, so half of the people are. A good amount of medicinal chemists and the rest is none of the above, but I haven't received any messages yet what you are. If you feel wanting to out yourself, we'll be happy <laughs> to know. Um, okay, so uh, another question that our uh, speakers would be interested in is, are you working in an academic setting, in a commercial company, or in a governmental institution? And I promise that's the last poll before we start, after this, the science uh, begins. Someone just wrote me, he's just a concerned citizen, which I find a really good reason to participate as well. So maybe we should have had this fourth answer here. <laughs> okay, most of the people have voted. I'm going to close this in five, four, three, two, one. 
Okay, and there are the results. Most of the uh, participants today are from the academic research environment with a third of the people from the companies as well. Okay, so I think uh, speakers should be having quite an idea whom they're talking to today. And with this, I think we could start the scientific part. Great, thank you very much, Franca. So we're going to start off. Um, Frank is going to talk us through about bit about the background to the project, how it started, uh, and in particular about the crystal fragment screen that was carried out. So over to Frank. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you again, Franca and and Biosolvit for hosting this. Um, I hadn't we hadn't quite appreciated the size of the audience um, for this when we started. So it's been. A bit overwhelming um, and of course um, it hasn't been done before and um, so we are certainly making up a lot of things as we go um, and it's been quite interesting to see um, or impressive how, how much <laughs> latitude we get for this um, so maybe where it started technically was <clears throat> um, way back in, in my head certainly when we started building the XCAM facility for fragment screening and crystals um, so directly by screening and crystals, um, this was uh, back about six or seven years ago when I joined Diamond. Um, it seemed to me axiomatic that if one observes the fragment heads directly, you ought to be able to accelerate compound design enormously. Um, whether that would be true or not would be borne out, but it, that was the basic premise. And um, we've had many projects. Um, it's been a running facility for um, formally since 2016. And uh, we've had many projects and, and many users from academia and industry that come and screen um, routinely. Um, and so you know that we can turn around projects quite quickly. Um, the other thing we've been doing all along, certainly the projects I myself have been involved in, if not our users necessarily, is to try and make our data um, available immediately. So these are projects that are run from the Structural Genomics Consortium, which is what I'm involved with at, at Oxford. Um, so we already had been trying to oil the wheels, grease the wheels for um, data production, so crystal graphic screening to make that fast um, within a week, if you like, and then see if we can get interpreted data into the public domain very quickly. And the SGC product projects in the last year or so, we have been able to do that much faster. But of course, the visibility of these projects, because they're early stage projects, hasn't always been very high. So in that sense, this COVID project, this main priority has really fell on fertile ground because um, we really streamlined quite a lot of it or had ambitions to streamline a lot of it and also build this Frigalysis platform, which um, you, you have now seen, um, to try and serve not just the files, but the actual interactive thing. Um, and so when the, when the Chinese group solved the main priority is, um, in, in January, and then my, when my colleague Martin um, Welsh at Diamond sort of and his team, when they re, re, reproduced crystals or, or got APO crystals in high resolution, I was able to tell my team and, and um, other collaborators to just drop things and move as fast as we could. So essentially, um, sort of confront true reality, which is um, a, a real urgency. And so we had two weeks of beam time left when. Um, when we got those, or when Martin got the crystals. And um, in that time, we managed to, because we have a very experienced team, a very good team, I should emphasize, um, also on Martin's side, um, we were able to, to do this, to make sure the experiment was as precise as possible with as few mistakes as possible, so that in those two weeks, we managed to test 1,500 crystals and get the data we did. And um, so, so it, it, and, and of course, um, Nir as well is an old collaborator we published together the year before, and he'd um, very much uh, uh, put on the on my mental map the power of covalent compounds and that this is an ideal complement. And he was also almost similarly on standby to move very fast. So that's why he was able to produce the mass spec screening in a matter of a day or less and, and tell us which compounds to use. So. The whole thing was sort of set up to, to produce data. Um, I should add, it, it's, at some level, it's, it's a low-hanging fruit because the target had been worked on uh, thoroughly for SARS, uh, since the SARS um, epidemic 
outbreak um, almost 20 years ago. So it was possible to move fast and quite a lot was known about it. Nevertheless, this um, starting information wasn't out there in that form. So um, I think, as I said, it, it fell on fertile ground, but that didn't itself give rise to the whole moonshot idea. Um, certainly in my head, I've from the beginning known, it's kind of obvious to anybody that fragment work, it's not hard getting fragments, it's really hard knowing what to do with them. Um, so this question of how to follow things up has dominated my my research in the last few years to try and um, come up with, you know, not come up with necessarily new ideas, but to streamline ideas that exist. Um, so we're not really there yet, obviously, few people seem to be there. But um, I've always assumed that the hits on their own ought to be enough if we knew what to do to design potent compounds. So for me, that's axiomatic. It's a premise. I see. I seem to share that opinion with a number of people. Certainly, um, um, if you complement it with covalent approaches, it still feels axiomatic that one ought to be able to achieve a really potent compound in one leap if we knew what to do. And that's the key. I mean, algorithmically, we don't know what to do. But that's when when Alpha contacted me uh, shortly after, or Matt Robbins and his team, presumably after talking to Alpha, contacted us um, via via Twitter to say if they could help. And when we started thinking about it, um, it seemed to uh, we grew up uh, grew this idea from that premise that um, if Alpha's algorithms were able to come up with synthetic roots that that are easy to make, and if we did have the data or the enough observations in that data set to be able to um, derive potency, the missing ingredient would be a lot of smart brains um, to try and piece together designs that, that might achieve it. And then of course we have to think of a way to test those designs. So um, that was the origin of the project. It's It's been a steep learning curve. Um, it's also been quite amazing to see the input. Um, I should add that John Kudir has also been obviously involved. Uh, we've been talking for a while as well about the computational question, what sort of algorithms can one bring to bear on this? Um, for me, it's always a, a question of curiosity. I myself don't have strong opinions, but it's really interesting to see how diverse the ideas are that are in the field and um, how far from maturity they are just by their nature, because it's all exploratory. Um, and so what this, this whole project has essentially been sort of a test drive, if you like, um, at one level of this premise. Um, and, and the premise may be wrong, but it seemed worth a try because of the urgency of this problem. And so that's where we are. Um, and I think it's time to hand over to the next person in the chain. Um, but I will just say that uh, the one other point, which was interesting about the, the size of the response, um, which took me aback, I should be quite honest, um, has been Amazing, but maybe not that surprising because when you look around the landscape of efforts to go after COVID, there's a lot of places where one can comment. You can always comment on social media and Twitter and whatever else. There's not many places to actually um, achieve action. And um, I think that's something that the scientific community might want to reflect on um, going forward. That there's lots of smart ideas, but not good outlets for it unless you write a grant and wait for a year or whatever. And so um, maybe that is one reason why this project hit the nerve. Uh, not that I expected it, but um, yeah, I'll hand over now. Great, thank you very much, Frank. So uh, next we're going to hear from uh, Nina London, who's going to be talking us about the um, covalent fragment screen and the rationale for covalent uh, molecules. Um, I think that Nia also is going to do a bit of a poll. Can you, um, Nia, just let us know when you want the poll questions coming up? I don't know if you want them now or uh, later. Uh, I guess now is fine, and then we'll address the answers yeah. after that was my keyword then. <laughs> so Nia would like to know from you guys which covalent warhead you think will be the best <laughs> candidate for the best successful for a clinic clinical candidate. Are you thinking about acrylamide, chloracetamides, alpha ketoamides, or nitriles? So make your vote. I used the time to come up with an organizational comment. So John uh, sorry, Frank wasn't showing his screen. This is not a technical error. It was meant to be like this. Maybe for near you, if you don't show your screen, you might want to switch on your camera. Otherwise, it feels like it's a mistake to our participants. Okay, so coming back to our covalent warheads 
half of you have chosen. <laughs> if I wonder if the rest of you has an opinion uh, on this. Uh, I hear in the chat box that some want to answer. I'm not qualified to answer this, so I might better close this poll in five, four, three, two, one, and uh, share the results with you. So it's a pretty mixed oh. uh, answer <laughs> here. Oh. Roughly uh, a tie between acrylamides, alpha ketamides, and nitriles here, but obviously not. Actually, it has any chose chloracetamide. Sorry, I thought I there was a percentage that they're not suitable. Uh, all right. Okay. So uh, my lab is uh, focused on the discovery of uh, covalent ligands for target proteins. Uh, we have computational tools for that, and we have an um, experimental platform for that. And as Frank mentioned in the past, uh, we collaborated on showcasing how uh, uh, electrophilic fragment screening can be combined with uh, high-throughput crystallography to really very rapidly progress uh, the design of covalent chemical probes. So when uh, Frank told me they have the protease protein, uh, we set everything up. So as soon as they shipped us the protein, uh, within a day, we ran a preliminary intact protein mass spectrometry screen, uh, and we're actually very surprised. So we used our, our default settings for this screen, uh, which are screening uh, about a thousand compound at 200 micromolar per uh, compound per fragment, uh, and we got too many hits. Everything hit the protease uh, to different extents, but but uh, too too much to analyze even. So uh, the day after, we ran a uh, follow-up screen at much more stringent conditions. So instead of 200 micromolar, uh, at only five micromolar, so 40 fold less. And uh, instead of 24 hours incubation with the protein, which is our default, at um, only one and a half hour incubation at room temperature. Uh, and even under these conditions, we got more than 100 compounds that are able to label the, the protease. Uh, but a few of them now in the stringent condition, a few of them really came out as more promising. Uh, one um, sort of attribute of our platform, because we already ran it against a lot of different proteins, we, we sort of know which compounds are promiscuous and which are not. Uh, and so we prioritized for uh, the team at Diamond which fragments we think are, more, uh, are most suitable for uh, crystallography. Uh, and they were able to produce about 40 complexes uh, with these covalent fragments. Uh, so as, again, as Frank mentioned, we previously uh, were able to show that merging covalent and non-covalent fragments, even just merging of two of them, uh, was able to dramatically increase the potency of the, of the final compound. Uh, that gave us sort of the, the notion that maybe within very few rounds of iteration, we'll be able to reach uh, our target potency. However, uh, one thing that we stumbled upon pretty fast, and, and this is also the reason why I posted uh, this poll at the beginning of the session, is uh, the fact that there are no precedented chloracetamides as in, in clinical candidates or, or in drugs, actually, in approved drugs. Uh, and so we, we feel that we need to switch from all, all of the covalent uh, crystal structures were with chloracetamides, which have slightly higher reactivity than the other three groups that I mentioned, which do have precedence in approved drugs. Uh, and so uh, the second wave uh, of the crowdsourcing uh, ideas were for, for covalent fragment merges ideas, and specifically focusing on nitriles, alpha ketoamides, and acrylamides. Um, and now we're sort of trying to prioritize uh, these, but uh, we're also trying in parallel to get more structural data. So going back to the mass spectrometry screen, uh, we identified a few acrylamides that did show uh, robust labeling of the protein, and these are now prioritized uh, for, for uh, further uh, structural determination in complex with the protease, and we hope that after we get some acrylamide-bound uh, fragments, we'll be able to merge these or at least understand the relationship between how chloracetamides bind the protease to how acrylamide uh, bind the protease. Uh, and, and if we have acrylamide, these are certainly in a regime that uh, drug discovery is comfortable with uh, and that we may take forward towards a potential uh, lead candidate uh, for development. So um, I think 
what's also we, we've learned through this effort is that a lot of the computational tools that are available for small molecule uh, design and discovery can't really handle well uh, covalent compounds. So many of the people design compounds using docking. Uh, there are precious little uh, software for covalent docking. We developed one such program, Docovalent, uh, but even when we applied that uh, program to the design, the covalently designed molecules, uh, it didn't give too many sensible results. In part, this is because uh, it was designed for, for screening rather than modeling, so it's designed to very rapidly screen uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of compounds and not so much for accuracy in modeling. Uh, another reason may be the, the designs simply don't fit the way they were uh, made to, to bind to the protein, uh, but uh, seeing all the, the different approaches that people take in order to, to model in uh, the design compounds, it really accentuates how, how little is done uh, from a covalent aspect. So I hope maybe this challenge will also spur uh, the community to develop more uh, software that's dedicated for covalent uh, inhibitor design. Uh, and just to finish, I think that uh, I do think that the fastest route to um, to a drug will be through the covalent route, uh, since the cysteine, as the screen showed, is is super nucleophilic. Uh, it would allow us to use a very mild electrophile, uh, which will likely be safe uh, and will give us a lot of potency. Uh, and uh, I hope you can contribute more covalent uh, design ideas uh, and also help us prioritize the one that we already have. With that, I'll let the next speaker. Okay, uh, many thanks, uh, Nir, for your, uh, uh, for your presentation. Uh, next, we're going to hand over to John Kadira, who's going to talk about the free energy perturbation and the docking. Thanks so much. Hey, yeah. uh, could you uh, share my screen for me? Uh, I think you can share it now. All right. Yeah, we see it. Thank Perfect. you so much. All right. My name is John Cadera, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some of the computational chemistry I'm helping support. Um, so I was tapped by uh, Frank von Delft and Alpha uh, to see if we can do some uh, some of our um, standard computational chemistry uh, tools, or use some of our standard computational to uh, tools to help triage some of the um, designs at the stage of selecting um, uh, different compounds. So I'm a, an assistant member, associate member at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and I'm also uh, involved in the Folling at Home Consortium, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing to help. Um, see if I can get the next slide. All right, so the initial uh, set of compounds was, uh, of course, contributed from all sorts of different, uh, different schemes. People would sketch molecules by hand. Uh, they used machine learning or uh, AI to design new compounds. They used physical modeling. There was a great variety of really interesting different designs. And our goal at the first stage was just to filter out any problematic designs that simply couldn't fit or couldn't recapitulate the interactions that the fragments had. So uh, what we did is just came up with a very simple ensemble docking where we used the inspiration fragments to align the compounds that uh, folks had submitted and uh, using shape and cover color overlays. And then we docked them to all the crystal structures for which they listed inspiration fragments in case little motions in the, in the protein were responsible for uh, better fits. We minimized the poses and scored them, and then we took the best pose from all the structures and then just triaged some of the very poor scores where we weren't able to find a good way for the compound to fit in. And then this was uh, fed to the next stage where we were looking at synthetic accessibility. Alpha will tell you more about that. Uh, and then the, ultimately the first set of, of non-covalent compounds were selected for synthesis. Our focus was really on this non-covalent complex as Nir alludes to, it's really difficult for um, uh, covalent uh, complexes to be modeled accurately, and there's a lot of uh, interest in coming up with new ways or better ways. We're recruiting some support from more uh, folks more experienced with covalent docking tools that exist commercially uh, to assist in this round. Um, so all of the tools here are also uh, uh, all online. Uh, we put on our folding at home GitHub um, the uh, uh, the files we used and the scripts we we built. We were using the OpenAI OE docking toolkit for most of this, just because it's very uh, reasonable and uh, rapid to put together ensemble docking tools like this. Um, you're welcome to take a look at it and download it. I'll also throw these slides up on my website when I'm, uh, when I'm done. So uh, the hybrid docking really aims to try to uh, maximize the shape overlay of the fragments. And this could mean that either people have designed really nice fragment extensions or fragment mergers that uh, recapitulate existing fragment interactions then extend to make new interactions uh, and pick up potency that way. 
or uh, things that are essentially bioisosteres that overlap with existing fragments but then pick up new interactions. Um, there's a great variety of different scaffolds that people have sketched out, many, many different scaffolds. And of course, the fragments themselves had a variety of different scaffolds as well. So we wanted to also see if we could pick a, a slightly longer term strategy to find really potent compounds amongst the designs and suggest those to be put into chemistry as well. Um, the idea there is that we could use alchemical free energy calculations. And of course, uh, if the scaffolds are very different, we would have to use absolute alchemical free energy calculations. These calculations pick up all of the entropy and enthalpy as part of the free energy by going through these alchemical intermediates. But of course, absolute calculations are also known to be very expensive. Um, they uh, are not generally used in uh, drug discovery right now, but our lab has been developing with many collaborators um, ways to do this uh, effectively. And uh, we also had mobilized the Folding at Home Consortium, which is a group of uh, PIs that picked up Folding at Home uh, from Vijay Pandey, who founded it at Stanford uh, about 20 years ago now. This is the 20th anniversary. Um, and we've been using it for various uh, research related to COVID-19 and working with various collaborators on various things from stru generating structural ensembles or identifying potentially druggable op opportunities through cryptic pockets. So we thought we would also see if we could help with prioritizing compound synthesis with free energy calculations. Um, the response from the community has been quite fantastic. Uh, thanks to all of the wonderful people who have donated the computing cycles, Folding at Home went from 100 petaflop throughput, which is still pretty substantial, to 2.4 exaflops, making it more powerful than the top 10 supercomputers in the world at this point. We're working on a variety of different projects, but just to give you an example, um, we had to pick a method that was going to work well on uh, the Folding at Home distributed architecture. So that means we probably didn't want to do Hamiltonian replica exchange for these free energy calculations, which was sort of the standard at the time. Instead, we've been exploring these single replica methods um, and we're, we're using both, uh, both single replica methods and the new non-equilibrium methods that uh, Bert de Groot has pioneered uh, for computing relative free energies. I'll mention that in just a second. Just to show you the scale of the calculations that we're doing right now, we have right, almost 6,000 free energy calculations on moonshot compounds running right now and 50,000 using another a strategy that uh, Tim Dudgeon and Frank von Delft had been working on for enumerating uh, elaborations of the fragments. Um, so this is a lot of free energy calculations. We're using the new Parsley uh, Small Molecule Force Field from the Open Force Field Consortium. I'll mention that in just a second. Uh, and then we're using this cell, single replica self-adjusted mixture sampling. It's like an ensemble, expanded ensemble approach where a single walker can hop back and forth between different alchemical states in an optimally adjusted way. And something like 560,000 trajectories are running on Folding at Home. And this work is really uh, being pushed forward by Matt Hurley in the Vincent Boltz lab, uh, part of the Folding at Home Consortium. Um, so he's uh, starting to get data back after six days. Again, these calculations are still difficult to converge even at this scale. Uh, something like 450 micro microseconds of MD have been generated uh, at a rate of 70 microseconds a day aggregate for the solvated complex. And for some of these complexes, we're getting good convergence. As you can see, different independent calculations converge to pretty close to uh, a, a signal that suggests that this is a decent binder. Um, but we're still working on uh, ways in which we can accelerate convergence uh, for uh, other batches of compounds. Um, we were using this open force field uh, from the, uh, partially from the open force field initiative. We just had our first release in October and it showed that we can take something like GAF1 and then uh, move it forward towards more predictive accuracy over the course of automated optimization cycles that are continuing to occur right now. So anyone can use this force field. We think it's a little bit better than the existing public force fields uh, and you're welcome to, to play with it and try it. Uh, we're also gearing up to run relative free energy calculations to help with smaller ligand modifications later in the stage uh, by running these unfolding at home in a tighter cycle. Uh, we'll be using non-equilibrium switching, again pioneered by Bert de Groot, uh, but uh, using a tool called Percy's, also open source, built on OpenMM, uh, using the GPU accelerated OpenMM core. Um, and with that, uh, that's the end of my uh, section and I'll hand it back. Okay, many thanks, John. Um, and so next we're going to um, hand over to Alpha, who's going to talk about the uh, moonshot idea itself and uh, a bit about the prioritization. Alpha, you just let us know when you want to have the questions. Do you want, should, I, should we go to the questions now? Yep, why not? Yep. Okay, so uh, Frank, do you want to put up the next set of questions? So you have heard a lot of this uh, project now and we're wondering, did you guys submit compounds? So there are many people here probably not having heard from this project for the first time. And so half of you have voted. Simply yes, no thing. 
and I wish the rest could give a little vote. And uh, this is the last chance. I'm going to close it in five seconds. You are probably tired of hearing me counting, so I just do it now. <laughs> and uh, I'm surprised by this result. I actually thought there would be a majority of people attending today who have actively submitted compounds, but that's not the case. Okay. So, uh, Alpha, do you want to go on then? Yep. Uh, thanks, uh, Franca and uh, Lisa. Do you guys see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, so I would talk uh, briefly about um, who we are and about the Moonshot project um, in, in general. Um, so a little bit about uh, who we are and how we entered the project. So uh, for I am Alpha, uh, the Chief Scientific Officer of Coursera and also a group leader slash assistant professor at the University of uh, Cambridge. And uh, we ended the project when we saw Frank uh, and, and Martin's tweet about um, structures being published in 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 diamond in diamond about uh, on the COVID uh, main protease, and we thought, wow, the fragment looks amazing, and we can really escalate those fragments into a drug. Uh, and we realized that actually one of the challenges is how do we rapidly uh, synthesize molecules and design molecules and that's something that we have been thinking about working on both in my research group and and also Postera, which is my startup um briefly about um as frank alluded to the COVID moonshot uh is a consortium of scientists uh, aiming to develop an antivirus as soon as uh, possible and uh, we call it moonshot because you know that this is a tall order um, but we are very emboldened by the sort of high quality structural biology work done in Oxford, the, the synthesis work, uh, uh, rapid turnaround time enabled by machine learning uh, done at Enamine, and also the uh, advent of, um, sort of high throughput simulation um, that John articulated to. But actually, most importantly, uh, we thought the community of medicinal chemists can really help us uh, and. That's why we opened up a uh, crowdsourcing um, challenge where we ask you guys to all input your suggestions on how to fragment merge. And we think that this allows a diversity of ideas to enter into the funnel, making sure that um, we are not biased by certain uh, prejudices, but in, instead all the ideas um, from you guys can enter the funnel. Uh, and hopefully for, because of that, because we open up the funnel, flat we are we are able to accelerate hit the lead so postera um, i mentioned this name multiple times is a is my startup which offers medicinal chemistry as a service powered by machine learning we are based in both the uk and the us uh, recently funded um, by the y combinator as well as other uh, venture capitalists and basically uh moment we're going to go in touch with frank we, we are both me and frank are super excited about uh this idea of escalating fragments to drugs and Postera immediately designed a uh, platform for crowdsourcing um, submissions from from you guys all over the world and in less than two and a half weeks we got uh, 3,500 submissions uh, from 400 contributors um, to be honest we we are very very uh, humbled and pleasantly uh, surprised um, as Frank alluded to and what is interesting is that you guys are extremely creative and only, we only, you see only 32 duplicate um, designs. And that re really mean, um, I, think, I guess, validates the hypothesis that the fragments itself is a very rich set of fragments and there are many different ideas and ways to pursue it. And there are also many different methodologies used in constructing these submissions. And I think that's really important in allowing us to make sure that the, the structures entering the funnel is broad enough so the first 250 compounds are, have been made by uh, Enamine and I believe um, should have been shifted to Oxford uh, earlier today or uh, perhaps early, or early tomorrow to be tested against main protease activity. Frank will talk about our testing cascade. So you may say, well, why do we believe that um, this moonshot um, could work and what, what is unique about this COVID moonshot? I think there are several um, features which I think are quite, um, 
different, and I think that's why we are quite optimistic. The first is that it's an open science initiative where all the data, I emphasize all the data shared immediately uh, with no IP constraints. Um, and that echoes XCAM's uh, success in immediately posting data online. I think that drives the whole community and we and this moonshot carries on this philosophy. And, and it's not only the data, but also ideas and insights in the sense that we have built a forum. We encourage you guys all to participate in this forum where we discuss each other's ideas and strategy. As I said, we crowdsource expertise from chemists around the world. We think a lot of you got medicinal chemists are working from home while it's left and projects are put on hold. And that I think contributes a rich set of ideas um, is evidenced by 3,500 different submissions. And, and, and the final point is we the use of machine learning to rapidly expedite this whole process of triaging and later on lead optimization. So we, you, we, we are able to triage 3,500 sub, uh, submissions, or rather back then 2,000 submissions, um, within 48 hours um, to design synthetic routes. And we are rapidly able to know uh, which molecules is makeable and what's the optimal route to realize these molecules. And I give you uh, on, on the screen is one such route. You can explore the routes that we have suggested online for the first wave of submissions. And we think that means that um, we narrow down the molecules that are um, synthetically accessible, which allows our collaborator in the mean to sort of rapidly make these molecules and test them. And that I think rep really increases um, efficiency and decreases cycle time. Synthesis has always been, as you guys know, um, one of the stumbling blocks and redetermining steps in the early stage process of drug discovery. A little bit more about um, our synthesis technology, which my group and Postera um, developed. Um, in a nutshell, the synthesis technology basically learns the rules, rules of chemistry from scratch using a natural language processing approach. Um, we look at reactions that have been reported in US patent and treat, which is around 9 million reactions, and treat reactants and reagents as a language and product as a language and basically perform machine translation uh, to predict the product given reactants and reagents. We have validated this approach in a series of publications showing that this approach achieves over 90% accuracy in predicting the major product given reactant and um, reagents. Um, and it uh, outperforms human chemists in benchmark tasks and also uh, validated this with Pfizer, folks in Pfizer showing that it can predict challenging medicinal chemistry, um, synth synthetic route and transformations. And basically through retrosynthesis, we invert this natural language processing um, model to search retrosynthetic route. And importantly, uh, we, are a we, we, we constrain the algorithm to even mean building blocks. I think that's important. And that shows why we think so computational techniques are important because we're able to constrain the starting material to this uh, few million inner building blocks and also billion uh, of uh, inner real space uh, molecule, molecules. And, and that I think showcases why we think this search methodology of machine learning is, is, is important, is, is a force multiplier because you might be able to have a gist of so same Oldrich catalog, um, but I think the use of machine learning allows us to rapidly know which highly functionalized building blocks are already in stock or makeable um, as part of the real space. And I think these highly functionalized building blocks, and there, there are a lot of them now uh, through uh, molecule suppliers, means that we can make rapid progress by just coupling and knowing which molecules are so good battles to fight in synthesis is exactly what this software does. And later on, um, we, all also, we also have uh, in-house several softwares which allows us to uh, perform uh, lead expansion and lead optimization, again, coupled uh, closely with synthetic accessibility. So we can design essentially divergent schemes that can explore a library of um, compounds uh, synthetically accessible and maximally informative in terms of probing um, the medicinal chemistry of the protease um, receptor. And, and that's where we are at right now. We, um, I would talk about sort of next steps uh, at the very end um, and I would hand it uh, back to Lisa 
comment. Okay, but yeah, thank you. So I think next we're hoping to hear from Frank just to um, fairly quickly talk us through the screening cascade that we're proposing to use to evaluate the compounds further. Um, yes, I don't seem to have my web webcam correctly. Um, I think we're running quite a bit late, so I'm going to be quite quick because not least um, Lisa has a, um, posted a good write-up of how we want to test these things on, on the um, Postera website. Um, I'll just say one thing. Postera managed to um, generate their website in about a matter of days, which was absolutely gobsmacking. Um, and the whole idea was cooked up in a few late night phone calls in the course of possibly 48 hours, um, uh, if, if I remember correctly. It was quite wild. And this was phone calls with Alpha, me, and John and Nir. Um, anyway, so, so this question of how we actually go about converting these ideas into reality is, of course, key. There's no point in generating ideas. In fact, there's quite a lot of ideas in the into tubes at the moment. Um, so this cascade captured what we were thinking about last week, and it's continuously updating. Um, what we were lucky to get is some people that volunteered significant time to help us think through what we might do. People with lots of experience from pharma, um, and um, I think they're, they, they show up on the forum, um, which is, has been handy. And so the goal we're trying to do is to minimize the time um, to get to a clinical candidate, um, which is obviously um, quite a long stretch goal, as Alpha pointed out. But we try to think through especially the logistics. So the premise here is, um, as Alpha said, that the um, if we find the compound we want needs to be easy to make because if you know there's lots of antivirals out there in principle um, it has to be easy to make it has to be anti properly antiviral and it has to be safe those are our three premises so if it's not easy to make these compounds we shouldn't be doing this um, others can do the the harder things and that are finely tuned so it's a bit of a search argument so we're not foreseeing long um long design makes or many design make test cycles per compound of the series we just want to make as many of them as possible um, so we've got this broad funnel approach um, and and then um, we keep as much of the testing with enamine at this point i should also add that enamine have been amazing they immediately leapt up to the idea we we're extremely excited by it um, did a lot of groundwork to stay open um, and their infrastructure at this point, I've been key, but also they've really been pushing the boundaries, as far as I can tell, of what um, what CROs can provide. Not necessarily uniquely, but you know, the CRO our CRO infrastructure has, has been quite the development of the last um, decade, and in the mean, really are at the forefront um, of the technology. Um, I'll say one other thing, by the way, this is, um, commentary generally about the COVID thing. Um, What's been interesting to watch is how many labs around the world have stopped uh, working and just shut down. And um, I think when we look back on this phase, we will recognize that that the, if you like, the administration of of our scientific infrastructure um, possibly just bottled it because we, the scientists are presumably key to this and probably need to work harder, not less hard. Um, so that's been okay for us because we've got lots of eyeballs on it. But if you just think overall, um, maybe this is not the way labs around the world should respond. But some labs have been really proactive. Enamine is one of them. Diamond has been working very hard to manage to stay open, and especially virology labs that we're tapping into. Um, so that's been great. We've been lining up an alliance of, of labs that could help. Um, so yeah as much as possible stays with enamine and then some of the things will be done outside and which this the whole point of the scheme is to line up the logistics you can get the scheme on, on, on the forum um, by the way um, so the idea is to line up the logistics so that um, the moment we know that there's um, potency or, or inhibition then the rest of the things can kick off so um, this is broadly the timeline the first batch of compounds um, have arrived in Oxford today. They're being tested for activity right now and being soaked into crystals literally as we speak. Uh, in fact, I think the data collections on the beam line are running now. Um, so we have to turn the data around quickly. Um, what Enamine will also be doing is testing solubility and um, some assessing um, computation of the, the toxicity of these things. So the moment we have readouts from the Proteus assay, what Enamine will be doing is to do some more thorough um, 
toxicity and permeability and more thoroughly um, um, uh, uh, solubility uh, assessment for log D. And um, the moment these and these data we feel are crucial because that needs to inform whatever we do when we test for antiviral activity. Because the moment you go into the biological system, there are many confounding factors, and the um, way we were thinking about it was we need to make sure that we don't confuse ourselves and we can line up a number of assays up front, even if it costs a bit more money, to be have as much a, as power, as strong a readout as necessary. And then uh, the other thing that would happen once for the things which have good protease uh, inhibitory, inhibitory activity, the scale up of synthesis would start quite quickly um, so that um, we can, in principle, go for PK um, assays if, if the numbers pan out. And we've got this first wave of, of designs, which which were submitted late in March, and the second wave, which was submitted last week, and both of these will sort of run in parallel. And this essentially is scalable to the extent that we are funding it in, in available. Um, so I'll say one more thing that we try and evolve this very actively. We have to. Um, for instance, we had this fast track idea that we were still discussing last week. Upon review and after reflection amongst the, the, the sort of team and uh, people that were advising us, we decided to drop that. It just didn't make sense. Um, and it's um, so we are very much trying to respond to, to inputs and things which are realistic which and which are not. Um, I'll say one more thing about the assays. With this two assays that these are being run by in the um, lab of Chris Schofield a year in Oxford um, in the chemistry group. One is a rapid fire assay. So it's mass spec based monitoring of, of products, of cleavage products of the protease. And the other one is a fluorescence-based assay where you have a shorter um, peptide, which is cleaved, and as the two ends are separate, you, you lose fluorescence. And they have different um, features, and it feels worth having two different readouts. In the viral assays, we've been linking up with multiple labs around the world to see if, what kind of capacity they can supply, and the premises as well. If we get multiple readouts, this will give us much more surety of actually finding a compound that may have activity. What happens beyond that? We're still um, a bit in um, uh, in open water. We have to figure out what the next steps are. And until we have anything that's even potent, it didn't feel worth thinking that far. So and we'll be there sometime in May, if, if we are there at all. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. So uh, I think we're going to go back to Alpha, who's going to just quickly wrap up with uh, you know, what really the current challenges are and how we think people can help still contribute. Yep, so a one minute uh, wrap up of uh, next steps of what you can do. Um, so uh, thanks so much again for all the participation, um, for joining the webinar, but also for those who are participating in submitting structures, really humbled by the response. Um, what you can do first, um, we are now running a, I would say a, a crowd scoring round um, please um, go to our uh, website, covid.posterity.ai slash covid, and um, select your 10 favorite designs from other contributors and post them on the Moonshot forum. There's a forum, there's a forum post where you can do that um, and, and instructions of how to upload your uh, 10 favorite designs. Use whatever computational or non-computational techniques that you can. We, we really value your input and insights. This will help the medicinal chemistry team to inform the next set of compounds to synthesize an assay. Um, thank you for the 10 contributors who have already posted on, their, uh, on, our, on our forum, their top 10. Really, really helpful. Um, considering supporting us uh, via our GoFundMe campaign, we have reached uh, the 5,000 mark, although uh, many, uh, uh, there's still a, 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 a long, of, stretch go to go before we, we, we reach the um, full level of support required to finish uh, to complete the project the moonshot and finally share the word about COVID moonshot uh, in your network um, we will be launching our next design round soon so the first point is about commenting and prioritizing the next round will be design but uh, we will launch this after um, we receive the first batch of results and hopefully that informs uh, even more creative and insightful designs uh, so thank you very much um, for for all your participation and uh, and chiming in and listening to our pitch. Yeah, many thanks, Alpha, and thanks to all of the speakers as well.
Uh, and many thanks for everyone who's still on the line that we've still got a really good number of attendees. Um, so we're going to go back to Franca, who I'm hoping is going to be able to summarise for us um, some of the questions that we've been getting through on the chat to address to the panellists. Totally. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks all the great speakers here. It was super interesting. And I'm briefly sharing my screen here because uh, I realized that none of the guys showed the website actually. So covid.postero.ai. And uh, I saw we have a bit more than 100 people here and only 20 persons submitted compounds. So uh, with keeping in mind that half of you are computational chemists, I'm really wondering uh, why you didn't submit. That's why I'm wanting to show the website and want to show you how easy it is to submit, put your small string in here, put add there, fill in your affiliation or draw the compound if you're interested in, say what you did and then just submit it. Um, it's surprisingly low, the number of submitters here and uh, the widely mentioned forum you can reach on the top here in the toolbar. Okay, I just wanted to say that because I was so surprised <laughs> that no one uh, submitted compounds here. Um, I want to ask one last question, uh, which is directed to the people who did um, use software to, to design their compounds. Uh, I was wondering what software were you using? Was it uh, MOI or Maestro or the other Schrodinger tools? Was it CSAR or any other software? Um, I'm asking this basically because the Biosolvity is granting free CSAR licenses for the people participating in this uh, project and we would of course want to know if it was used, yes or not. Uh, for the people who used other software it would be of course interesting to know what brought you to your uh, goal. Okay, I guess the answer rate here will be a little lower so I'm going to close the poll in a second and uh, we'll share the results with you of course. And yeah, quarter of the people that have designed compounds did use CSER. That's really, really cool. Um, I will stop quizzing you now and we'll go to the question session. Every one of you feel free to um, put questions in there. There are a lot of questions waiting already. For the people submitting questions here, many of you did already mention to which speaker this is uh, directed. If you haven't, please do. Um, okay, so let's start with the question number one here, which is directed to Frank. Are you planning to pursue other uh, COVID targets with a method? Um, yes, uh, well, um, the, the method, if you're asking about the XCAM screening, um, Diamond is open for COVID projects. We've been inviting um, people to submit uh, proposals. We've had several proposals for other uh, targets. Obviously, there are a bunch of enzymes. These are eminently targetable. Some of them, not much is known about. Some of them, a number of them have been crystallized. For instance, the um, the group around the Chicago synchrotron SGCID, I think it's called. Um, they've solved, I think, three or four or five structures in in short order um, since January, and we're working certainly with them and others that that have crystals that seem to work. Um, when we have the hits. I, our sense is um, presumably those those um, submitters will be interested in, in in reaching out this network as well. We don't know. We don't have data yet, so we haven't really asked. Um, but our ambition would be to try and tap into this resource. Certainly, that's what I think. Um, it is. It's been quite amazing, and if possible, we might um, try and repeat this. That said, um, the logistics of it obviously multiply. So we'll have to start getting a lot smarter and, and organized if that is what we're going to do. But there is more data coming. There's no doubt about it, uh, even just from this, this project. Cool. Thanks. So there is a bunch of questions directed to Nir. Uh, first one is, do you think you could also screen dynamic combinatorial libraries with your MS pre-screening method, like a building block inspired by fragments? Yes, I think that's a very good idea. Uh, we don't have currently such libraries on hand, but uh, maybe we, that's something to check with Enamine. Maybe they can send us uh, libraries for DCC and we can screen them by MS. Actually, I, I really like this idea. Thank you for whoever's interested. <laughs> Super. The next one for you is uh, chloroacetamide seem to prefer the P1 pocket of the protease and with most of the site, active site being empty. And do you believe there is space for generating 
chiral chlorosetamides that would fit better in there? Yeah, good question. Uh, so currently it seems that all chloracetamides point their carbonyl group into this uh, small pocket that uh, aligns uh, three amide bonds from the backbone and not to the histidine that's considered part of the oxy and ion pocket. Uh, this, is, this has been peculiar, uh, but it also allows, because most of the covalent compounds go to one side of the pocket, it allows to think about a lot of merges with the non-covalent fragments who occupies the rest of the pocket. Regarding chiral chloracetamides, that's certainly something we thought about. So um, a modification coming off of the alpha position would make them chiral and could uh, both reduce the reactivity and um, extend the fragments. Um, I, I sort of touched on this. We, we got to a strategic decision to, to go from chloracetamides to less reactive compounds such as acrylamides, uh, alpha ketoamides, and nitriles. Uh, for this reason, I, I, I'm not sure we'll explore um, alpha modified chloracetamides, uh, but it, for, for just for, as a chemical probe or as an approach, I think it's suitable. Okay. Um, the next question would be to John. Would you mind uh, explaining the criteria used in the scoring function? So the, in this case, the first non-covalent docking we did is just a very simple screen for very poor uh, binders. So essentially all we did was uh, to use this ensemble docking score to all of the crystal structures that had been listed as inspiration fragments and pick the best score um, after uh, you know high resolution docking and uh, dense posing. And then we simply filtered out things at this point which had a score poorer than minus six uh, in the ChemGas force uh, function. And this just, just indicates things that we couldn't really find a good uh, docking pose for that recapitulated any of the interactions or just couldn't fit in the binding site. So that was just simply the triage for the first round. Uh, again, we, we didn't do a lot in terms of filtering out designs. Alpha can talk more about the final selection criteria, but we were really looking for uh, rapidly synthetically accessible molecules, which were uh, represented diverse starting points that we can move on from from there. Super, thanks. Uh, I guess I have a question to Frank. Will there be a round of uh, next iteration X-ray structures for the molecules that have been hit in the assay in the first round, have been hits from the first round? Uh, yes, I, I must have glossed over it. Um, the compounds are coming here to Oxford and Diamond. They're being shipped to both places simultaneously. Um, so um, the, as I said, Diamond is open. We soak the compounds directly um, at the same time as, as doing the protease assay. So we use the same approach as, as we have for the, um, uh, for the, for the screening to begin with. Um, uh, so we, we try and do that as quickly as possible. Um, there's a subtlety about this that soaking compounds that are quite potent may not always be the best way to see them. Maybe we have to co-crystallize them. Um, but we'll, soaking is the quick experiment. So we, we are doing that. And, we may, you know, if we find potency in the assay and haven't seen it in soaking, we then we'll go back and do a bit more crystal, um, crystallization experiments. But it's it seems key to get that readout. It's obviously in many examples of things which are potent, which you can't get to show up in a crystal. We'll figure out what we do about that. But I, I suspect we'll find quite a lot of structure information. Okay. Um, someone here is wondering if IP would be an issue with the submitted compounds. Did anyone check if they hit IPs of already um, drug space, so to say, or patented space? Um, can I take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, so so I think um, we have not checked any um, IP strategy at this stage. Um, it's more um, lead finding. Um, we think that um, we are very we a whole concern. Um, we don't operate on trying to secure any IP and if we found that a particular drug, which is owned by another uh, uh, farmer or whatnot is a great COVID candidate, then I think that's a great contribution um, to society to make them aware of that. And I think mechanism will, will, uh, will be in place to ensure that obviously once this is made publicly available, hopefully then it means that these drugs will get repurposed or developed further. So no, um, we have not uh, try to play IP games or patent bus or anything like that. Um, we, we just wanted to find the best compound as soon as we can, regardless of who or what owns that compound. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, I guess the next question is directed to you as well, Alpha. Will you be crowdsourcing on synthesis, especially on the compounds that are considered synthetically complex by your AI? Uh, yes, we would consider uh, crowd crowdsourcing for certain uh, compounds. In fact, um, our strategy is to make simple compounds through CROs, um, like you know what I mean, um, and then there will be a list of compounds which we think are uh, organic chemistry challenges, which will be uh, great if we have um, made, and we will post those uh, online as sort of the second tier of compounds, where then we encourage uh, people around the world um, with labs to open to have a go at it and try to make these compounds, uh, hopefully in time so that we can test it as part of this um, initiative. Um, and definitely, um, if we can figure out certain routes, we will definitely crowdsource them. Um, but I think the key, well, the reason why they didn't open up crowdsourcing for enamine, for enamine synthesized or CRO synthesized compounds is that you, we really need to work very closely with them to make sure the starting materials is exactly what is in stock. And we also use the most functionalized building blocks rather than trying to make building blocks from scratch. And that requires a, sort of designing the algorithm um, to make sure that we disconnect back to what they have. Can I add, add one thing? Um, there's one big, obstacle to crowdsourcing the synthesis that's the logistics of all these compounds um which is easy to forget but it's a real nightmare and so we have to think carefully of how to bring them together in one place and then ship them out again um so we have a scheme in mind um and we'll be trying to make that clear um in the, in the next week or so um so it's it's a non-trivial thing and uh, we can't just have uh, things ping around the world otherwise we um you'll lose sight and it will be pointless. Um, so we hope to have to resolve that and it will certainly be extremely powerful if it mobilizes. Super, Frank, there's directly another question for you. What are the key aspects of the desired target product profile for the protease inhibitor? So these are online on the forum. I don't know them by, by heart, but um, I'll give you, um, there's a post there and you should be able to find it quite easily. Um, our draft is, but the, what we had discussed extensively at the very start is whether we need to target particular routes of, of delivery, um, so oral or, or IV, and things I didn't know so uh, is that both of them have problems. So if it's IV, they have to be extremely soluble because otherwise you could just can't get enough compound into the patient. And if, um, if but the if they have to go oral, they need different properties. So we're actually staying open to which particular route we go to. And that's one reason for doing quite extensive tests very early on so that we can discover um, which is a, the likely um, delivery route and, and start lining up experiments accordingly. Um, now, I don't think I should discuss those, you know, I can, you can also read it online, so I, I'm not gonna read it out here, but um, I will say that we had got ourselves informed about it quite thoroughly. It feels like we have something somewhat rigorous there. Yeah, so there are many, many more questions. And for the sake of time, I will um, basically just allow two more because a few of them are relatively similar. And I think two things are really, really important. And the one uh, thing is directed to Alpha. How will the GoFundMe money be used? The GoFundMe money I will be used to uh, perform uh, synthesis. Uh, primarily, uh, prim uh, we'll be 100% dedicated to synthesis and testing. Um, we were managed by Postera, uh, but we would uh, put all the money into ordering and making compounds uh, through enamine uh, and other CROs and sh um, making sure these compounds are screened for ADMET um, assay in enamine. So 100% uh, consumables, 100% um, synthesis and testing. Super. Um, there is lots of questions around the whole submission, and um, I think I will briefly try to sum them up myself because I've gone through this. So I've showed you the website earlier. There's lots of information on it. Um, there is this forum where things like, are the docking poses available? Yes, that's all explained on the forum. Um, equally, the whole submission process is explained on this website. And yes, submission is still open, and it's not only open to computational chemists on the opposite. Medicinal chemists are highly welcome to submit compounds as well. And I think uh, I should do a follow up where I send this link to this video and put the link to this website and the forum in as well, because I get the feeling most of the um, submission questions are there. And uh, yes, guys, get active, 
design more compounds, they're still uh, being considered. And um, I think with this, we should close this session. If the speakers don't have any last points that they're wanting to address here. I will just say again, thank you, Franke, for hosting, for giving us this forum. And thank you, everybody else, for listening. It's been, as I said, quite overwhelming. Yeah. Very, very welcome. Thanks, all the participants. Many thanks to all the speakers here. It was great that you all took the time. And uh, I hope we can do a follow up. I get the feeling we have to. <laughs> and um, hope to see you all again. And uh, everyone stay healthy and safe in those times. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone.